I'll just start with introductions as people are settling in. Thanks for holding out for the last session of the afternoon. My name is Annalise Carrington. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Vermont, specifically with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. That's the part of the service that works on habitat restoration projects on private lands here in Vermont. And I'm here with my colleague Pete Emerson with the State Fish and Wildlife um, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge Fritz Gerhardt, who couldn't be here, but he's been an important colleague uh, with the Connecticut River Conservancy on this project. So we want to open uh, with why this work is important. Why are we wanting to restore a floodplain forest here in Vermont? Um, and why we're adapting our methods um, to try to improve our success with this work. Pete's going to describe his, um, his work up in the Northeast Kingdom with um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And I'm going to jump in with how we've expanded this work uh, this past field season and uh, what we see moving forward um, with this work. I'll pass it off to Pete. Great, thanks. Um, it's amazing, as soon as we start talking about getting vehicles in the water, all of the room fills right up. It's a forestry conference. Um, so some of the, the goals that we have for our restoration um, are kind of hinge on what, we, what, we, uh, what our objectives are. And so one of the first things we have to ask ourselves is what are floodplain forests? And from our perspective, there's a million different ways we could consider this, but to keep it really simple, um, they're just seasonally inundated forests. So the key word for us is that we're dealing with forests. They're not just riparian areas or riparian zones, they're forests. Um, so why restore them? Well, I don't think I need to say this too clearly, but um, th their habitat provides really important ecological benefits. Um, not just from water quality, which they do, um, but also for, um, for fish and wildlife, which is kind of how a fish biologist gets involved in this forestry aspect. Um, so yes, they do reduce the erosion and, and channel mitigation that we've heard earlier today. Um, they protect water quality, they reduce nutrients, um, they attenuate flooding, but from our perspective it also is about keeping the water cool. Keeping the water cool for a fisheries biologist is really vital because that allows us to have these cold water fisheries extend further downstream. Um, in a lot of our tactical basin plans across the state, you'll see um, real specific plans. And in the one in the Northeast Kingdom, we have um, we're talking about buffer plantings, um, and, and it's, that's a really great project for us to get involved in, and we continue to do that, but we wanted to talk a little bit about um, some tactical uh, uh, decisions we've made to change our methods a little bit. Um, so we've done a lot of tree plantings over the years, and one of the frustrations, oh, that's, that's beautiful. Now. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've seen is that a lot of the tree planting projects that we've done, I, I consider them lollipop forests individual trees planted um, along the stream bank, but they're not providing that, that long-term management objective that we have. And I was really interesting, interested earlier today to hear um, folks talk about really clear objectives. What are our management goals in the long term? What do we want to see? What do we want to call success? And for us, success starts right here with um, an old cornfield because that's what we all want, right? We want our riparian areas to look like old cornfields. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is when you walk away from an old cornfield, you get a forest. How many people have seen that in this room before? So a few people have seen a cornfield turn directly into a forest, and that's really vital. So what we were trying to do is take a look at, well, first of all, what's the difference between a cornfield and a hayfield and a pasture? It looks like it's been cut off. It hasn't. When you go back out and you look at seedling numbers, in old cornfields, a year or two years after it's been abandoned, you start to see a forest come out of the ground. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing here, box elder that are coming out of a uh, forest, are, are coming out of a cornfield. Um, when we look closely in hayfields, and we have 78 different plots, we're seeing single digit seedlings. And when we look in pastures, we've looked at smaller sample size, but we have zero, big fat zero on um, seedling recruitment. So what we're trying to do is, is take that approach and ask ourselves, can we take former hayfields and our path, can we take those former hayfields and pastures and cultivate them similar to cornfields? Because our goal is to grow a forest. Um, here's an example of how that works. In the top, former cornfield, a couple years later, you too can be in a picture like this. <laughs> 
So the project that we started, um, Fritz and Paul Hamlin, who is a wildlife biologist in the St. Johnsbury district, along with me, I'm a fish biologist there, and Fritz Gerhardt, he used to have a business on his own. We recognized this, we saw, we, we were all kind of frustrated with our tree planting projects, and so we dove directly into an experiment. Um, so you can see we did um, two sites. We have um, different replicates at each site, but the key here I want to show you is that each site has an A, a B, and a C. Those were done for two consecutive years. We treated them, and we have four different treatments. Um, our control, which we did nothing, um, a mow followed by a plow only, um, a mow followed by plowing and then applying herbicide to something that came up a few weeks later, giving it time to reestablish and then hitting it with herbicide, and then finally mowing, applying herbicide first, and then giving it a few weeks and then going back and plowing it. Um, two charts here. One is the percent of grasses. That's the one we want to see go down. And on the bottom, we have the percent cover of forbs, which we're talking about basically diversity. So we want to see that one go up. So the red would be pre-treatment. Um, the, the four, the, uh, the axis on the bottom, we have the control, with the, and then the three treatment types. And then we have dates, starting with June 2016, pre-treatment, and going all the way to um, this summer in blue. Um, the key takeaway is that you can see there's clearly a winner here. Um, plowing, giving it a few weeks, and then applying herbicide, we end up with those competitive grasses. In this case, it was almost exclusively reed canary grass. Um, oh, you know about that. And then on the bottom, we have our diversity index, right? We're seeing an improvement, which is what we all want. Not corn, but lots of other stuff. The beginnings of the forest. Pictures worth a thousand words. Here is pre-treatment. I think they all look the same. To me, they all look the same. Here's our lollipop forest in the back. This is a success story. This is a really successful tree planting for us in a reed canary grass field. But they still look like lollipops, and they do not look like a forest. This stuff on the background is the other side of the river. 2016. This is post-treatment. Year two. We did two years of treatment. Here is the first year following treatment, the next summer, in 2018. And you can see the control and the plow only start to look a lot alike after one year. The herbicide followed by the plow looks different. But this one in the bottom right, in 2018 and again in 2019, we start to get the results that we wanted. So again, this is what it looked like to start with. And now we're getting closer to what we want. But really it's about not just diversity, it's about growing a forest. That's our goal. We want to grow a forest. So let's look at the number of seedlings. In the control, again, the same sequence, 2016 to 2019, red to blue. The control, we just aren't seeing it. We don't really improve our numbers of seedlings. It's amazing that Fritz is even able to find seedlings in there. I'm, I had a hard time walking and seeing anything but reed canary grass. But by the end, we're starting to see that same technique is working, and we're seeing, we're seeing an improvement in the tree density. The bottom one is just talking about height. We had a turnip. Someone came in and took one of our sites and turned it into a turnip patch for deer. <laughs> we're going to use that one next. Um, so some of the challenges we've learned from this project is those were really narrow. They were meant for another purpose, but we had very narrow um, treatment plant sites, um, and we got creeping from a lot of the invasive exotics that you're all familiar with, familiar with, bindweed and whatnot, which started to impact our, our results. Um, the timing, the first year we got it right, we did our treatment in late summer. The second year, we went, we rototilled all those beautiful seedlings up, and we did it earlier in the summer, made a mistake, any farmer will tell you, if you're trying to treat those things, like the reed canary grass, you have to do it late in the summer. Um, but one of the big ones was we had no guarantee of success when we were relying on simply natural seed fall. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Seed production and dispersal is really important. And often cases, we're waiting for the floods to deposit seeds, and we can't rely on that.
So while Pete and his team were, were working on that the last few years, we at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were noticing the same things and asking ourselves the same question. Could we replicate those conditions, those cornfield conditions to, to achieve our restoration goals? So Pete and I finally connected last spring, spring 2019, and with some additional U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service resources, we were able to expand this work onto four new project sites this summer. The first of which was the La Platte Headwaters Town Forest in Heinsburg. Uh, the, we're working up in the northern, uh, northernmost part of the town forest there in that northern field. And the town forest committee was really excited to work with us on this project because they have been attempting restoration at, at this site for the last few years, planting trees with really mixed results. So the idea of trying something new for, for riparian restoration um, was exciting to them. So this site was actually the most similar to the sites that Pete was working with up in the Northeast Kingdom, dominated by reed canary grass. And we wanted to both replicate what Pete was doing and also expand on that work and really hone, hone his methods, hone these methods. So we were able to uh, establish much larger plots and we're also gonna be introducing direct seeding um, as a way to control for, um, for either a lack of seed source or conditions that um, aren't amenable to natural regeneration any given year. So we have replicates for each of our site preparation methods um, the first of which, what Pete found to be the most effective up at his sites, um, plowing, tilling, allowing for uh, rebound, and then using herbicide. We're also uh, um, comparing that with just plowing and tilling. Uh, so really trying to prove that the addition of herbicide does, does really give us um, results, um, better results than, um, than without. And also looking at only using herbicide, um, potentially two treatments in the fall and in the spring. The idea here being that we aren't going to be able to use heavy equipment at every, at every site. So getting out and being able to plow and till might not always be feasible. So can we achieve the same goal um, only using herbicide? And this was actually a great example because the southernmost part of this field was much wetter than the rest of the field and we couldn't get our, our plow out there. Um, so that became our herbicide only plot section. And then we have replicates for each of our direct seeding methods, hydro seeding, broadcast seeding, and natural regeneration as a control. And we'll get into that a little more later. So two other sites that we're working on, um, also using that herbicide only methodology for slightly different reasons. Uh, these are both along the Winooski River, uh, right by the mouth. This is the, um, the Ethan Allen homestead here in Burlington and then across the river, Pine Island Community Farm. So these, um, these are two sites where we're, we're really using the same method at a different scale. Um, the, the Pine Island site is much larger, and we, are, we used a tractor-mounted boom sprayer for the herbicide application. And then at Ethan Allen Homestead, a smaller site, we were able to use backpack sprayers. Um, we have plans for direct seeding here this coming spring. And then additionally, we wanted to look at organic methods, acknowledging that um, herbicide won't always be an option or won't always want to be something that we're using. So we, we looked to the Xerces Society Manual for Organic Site Preparation for Pollinator Habitat Establishment, for wildfire, uh, Wildflower Establishment. Um, so slightly different goals, diff different goals, but um, getting at the same concept of preparing a seedbed. So soil inversion, tarping, some other cover cropping. Um, the main takeaway here is that we wanted to, um, or we want to be developing a suite of techniques to be, um, to meet different site specific uh, needs for this work. Okay, so direct seeding. Um, we have done a lot of work the last year connecting with folks in other parts of the country that have been utilizing direct seeding for restoration. Uh, one of our first contacts and um, one of the most important has been with Matt Grabeau. He's a, a researcher out in the Southwest um, who has been working with different partners on a multi-year um, research project using hydro seeding as a method for, for direct seeding. So um, specifically with cottonwood and, and willow species. Um, and not only have they developed a methodology around, around the hydro seeding itself, but they've also dug into um, methods around seed collection, seed storage, germination rates, seeding rates, things that are gonna be really important for us moving forward as we're developing our plans for direct seeding. So this has been, he's been a great, um, 
uh, consultant and partner. And you just some pictures of their seeding efforts. Uh, we've also connected with um, the Minnesota DNR. They have a guidance around direct seeding, and uh, we referenced these, um, this guidance specifically um, digging into the specs around seed collection and storage and, and seeding, and um, a couple of foresters there have been great partners um, sending us information on, on um, site plans and a lot of photos of, of work that they've done. This is just a visual of, of how they're adapting equipment for a silver maple broadcast seeding on a floodplain site there. Uh, and even um, a, a researcher in Melbourne, Australia, they've, she's been a part of this um, relatively new project looking at direct seeding there. So um, the main takeaway being that we're not wanting to recreate the wheel here. Uh, we're really wanting to learn uh, from other practitioners and researchers, adapt that methodology to Vermont. Um, and going forward, this is going to be a place where I see a lot of growth. Uh, we'll need to be building our capacity here. Uh, this is an integral part of the work we're doing, and there's a lot of nuance to it. So um, I see this being something that we, um, we're really digging into going forward. And this, these are just some pictures of some seed that we collected already uh, this past spring and fall that's in storage that we'll be planning to use this spring. OK, so where are we going with this? Um, just to reiterate, we um, the fact that we can't control nature and we can't control the weather, that's going to continue to be a challenge for us. Um, invasive species, that's also something that I worry about with this, and, and we're going to need to be careful in how we're, um, how we're managing this work going forward so that we aren't um, running into issues with invasives um, invading, invading these sites. We're also going to have to be mindful that every site is going to uh, it, this work is going to need to be tweaked at every site we're working on. Um, and then I just wanted to show, this is actually a video, I don't know if it will play. Um, but when I was taking this video, this is a moldboard plow, I was thinking to myself, I've spent the last, you know, more than two years now trying to undo the impacts of agriculture on the landscape, and here I am, you know, uh, you know encouraging moldboard plowing on this site. So, you know, it's been a little bit of a mental leap for me, um, and so I think I put up here social and political barriers. Um, I think it's that that's going to be something that, that we need to work on. You know, this concept of disturbance being a tool that we can use um, as a means of frustration, um, and then always funding. Um, you know, trying to work with existing programs to to get this work done. That's it. Yeah, that's all. Rodeo. You consider burning? <laughs> you take that one? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more work, and uh, it doesn't work everywhere, and it doesn't always help you. You end up with a lot more invasive exotics. Almost well, always. In some you use it as Remember, a mix, mix of mowing, burning, and then herbicide. Right, it's, a, it's an option. We should, we're, we're, we've seen it, we've done it on other sites. You're standing next to a guy that can tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> it sometimes ends up making the problem worse because the seed bed is there already. Yeah. Now you're just you're creating this situation that they like better. The herbicide is very effective. Uh, do you see this uh, as becoming a funded practice at some point down the road? That's our hope. It, I think we're still in the proof of concept phase, but ideally, you know, just as an example, it could be incorporated into what NRCS allows for practice for riparian forest restoration um, through EQIP or through the CREP program. We're working that angle right now. We're in discussion. We're hoping that, it, that we can show them that it works often enough in these particular environments. So that it would, I don't think this, is a, this isn't a fixture everywhere, but in certain places this makes a lot of sense. As we've seen with previously worked cornfields. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where are you sourcing your seeds and do you see that as a limiting factor? Whatever roadside, yeah. we can get them. I, yeah. <laughs> I also should have seen, I was down at the Intervale this past spring scooping up cottonwood seed just by hand. And we ended up, uh, we have about three pounds of it frozen in storage right now, um, which should actually cover a remarkable amount of acreage, like multiple acres with just three pounds of seed. Um, and I think there's potential, we're working with the Intervale Conservation Nursery, getting them to help with, with seed collection efforts, or really contracting them, paying them to do that. And that's something that we'll need to be scaling up.